Hey guys, and welcome back to another Freaky Friday video on my channel. Firstly, I just want to say happy Friday the 13th. I personally am not too superstitious about Friday the 13th, but I do think that it's pretty cool that we get these random days thrown at us throughout the year that we can celebrate or that it's acceptable to kind of celebrate more creepy things. And because of that fact, I did want to do a more creepy phenomena or something like that today. But when I found out that this particular case took place on Friday the 13th, I figured that this would be a good opportunity to cover this case. Also, before we get into the video, I do just want to mention because when I do videos like this, I always get comments about it. If I'm looking a little bit tired or sounding a little bit tired, it is very, very early in the morning right now, so just that is why I look or sound the way that I do. So anyways, with that all being said, let's get right into today's video. Kitty Genovese was born in 1935 and was the oldest of four siblings in her large Italian family. She grew up in a predominantly Italian neighborhood in New York City, and anybody who knew Kitty said that she was just a really kind, smart girl. And she kind of even played the role as a second mother to her siblings because she was the oldest. And I feel like a lot of older girls do play that role in their siblings' lives when they are the oldest of all of the siblings. Kitty thought that right out of high school, her life was falling into place because she immediately got engaged. But a fork would be put into Kitty's life when her entire family, her mother, her father, and all of her siblings decided to move out of New York City and move to Connecticut. The reason for this was because Kitty's mother had actually witnessed a murder and she no longer thought that the city was a safe place for her and her family. But because Kitty was engaged to a man that would remain living in New York City, Kitty decided to stay back living in New York as well and she would be married in the year 1954. But sadly for Kitty, this marriage did not even last the year before the couple was separated. Now. After the couple got separated, Kitty's life kind of seemed like she didn't know what to do and she was looking for normalcy because, again, she had just gotten out of high school and she thought that her life was falling into place because it's a really big step in a woman's life to get married. It's a big step in anybody's life. So she probably thought that she had it all figured out and when the couple got separated, that really showed her that at this point she did not have things figured out. So because of this, she started to work several jobs, none of which she enjoyed, just to be able to kind of get that normal seat back so that she could afford an apartment on her own. And then in the late 1950s, Kitty got a job at a bar called the Eve's 11th Hour Bar. And she didn't actually mind this job. This was the first job that she worked that she could, I guess, like stand. And she moved up pretty quickly and eventually became manager. So first she was bartending, then she became manager, and she continued to bartend while she was managing at this bar. On top of that, she had also recently met a woman, and the two of them started to get romantically involved. This woman's name was Mary, and I believe that the couple met in 1963, and they just really hit it off, and eventually the two of them moved into an apartment together. So as you can see, Kitty now has a job that she enjoys, she has a romantic partner who she really, really likes, and things just seem to have been going really good in her life at this point, and she finally felt as if maybe she finally had things figured out. And then in the early hours of the morning on March 13th, 1964, Kitty had just finished up her work at that bar. It was around 2.30 a.m., and she had gotten into her car and was headed home. Now, New York, just like most big cities or even towns nowadays, has a lot of stoplights. Something I just want to say is I personally am an extremely paranoid person and I wouldn't even think that stopping at a stoplight with all of the doors to your car locked, no matter how late at night, unless you were in like a really sketchy area, I just wouldn't think that it was much of a threat. But on this particular night, while Kitty was driving home, she stopped at a stoplight, and that is when a strange man took notice of her. After stopping at this particular stoplight, it took Kitty 45 minutes to get to her apartment complex. Now, something that I just want to note here is Kitty's apartment door, so the door that you go into to get into either her apartment or the apartment building, I couldn't really verify, is located in a dark alleyway, which is as you can probably imagine, a prime spot for any attacker or anything like that because it's kind of enclosed and out of sight by passerbys. 
Kitty was about a hundred feet from her apartment door when all of a sudden she noticed a man coming straight towards her and that this man was holding a knife very firmly in his grip. This man was the man who had taken notice of Kitty over 45 minutes ago at that stoplight. His name was Winston Mosley and he was a complete stranger to Kitty. Kitty at this point was in a state of panic and she didn't know what to do so she just sprinted as fast as she could to get to her apartment door. But unfortunately Winston was fast too and he caught up to her and immediately when he did he grabbed her and stabbed her in the back twice. This case gets much, much worse, however, because although Kitty was in an immense amount of pain at this time, she was able to yell out for help. And there were several witnesses who heard Kitty crying out for help. Even one person yelled out from a oving, overlooking window from an apartment building for the attacker to leave that girl alone, but besides that, nobody did anything. The person yelling, however, was enough to scare the attacker off and he left Kitty in the alleyway. Now, although extremely injured and weak, Kitty still had enough energy in her to drag herself to the end of the alleyway where her apartment door was located. But once she reached the apartment door, she realized that it was locked and nobody was coming to open it. She laid in that alleyway for about 10 minutes before she saw a man entering the alleyway. Now I'm sure at this point, Kitty probably felt relieved because she thought that this person was coming to help her. This man had on a hat with a very large brim that was covering his face, which hid the fact that this man was not there to help Kitty. This was Winston Mosley returning to finish what he had started. Something that I can't stress enough in this case is that there were several witnesses who witnessed the first attack, saw Winston return, and then witnessed him stab Kitty several more times before ripping off her clothes and violently raping her in that alleyway. After he did this, he proceeded to take 50 bucks that I guess Kitty had in her pocket from working that evening, and then he left her in the alley alone to die. Finally, at this point, someone who had been witnessing the attack noticed, I guess, that it was completely quiet now and they wanted to know what was going on, so they walked down to the alley and that is when they found Kitty breathing her last breaths. And at this point, another witness who had witnessed the attack from start to finish finally decided to call the police. The entire attack went on from start to finish for about 30 to 40 minutes and again there were several witnesses who heard Kitty crying out for help. I believe some people were even watching the attack from their apartment windows and not one person thought to go down and help this woman or even to call the police. Authorities, after finally being called, arrived at the scene very quickly. They got there within 10 minutes, and Kitty was picked up in an ambulance at around 4.15 a.m., but sadly, she would pass away before they even arrived at the hospital. After Kitty's death, she was brought to Connecticut and buried in a grave in the town where her family was now living so that she could be close to them. This particular case also started a study into what is known as Genevieve syndrome or better known as the bystander effect. Many of the witnesses who witnessed Kitty's murder that evening were questioned by police and said that they didn't intervene in the attack because A, they thought that it was a romantic dispute or B, they thought that they were just drunk and arguing and they thought that in these kinds of situations it was better to just mind their own business. So now let's talk about the attacker a little bit. So the murderer was a 29 year old man by the name of Winston Mosley, who again spotted Kitty at a spotlight while she was driving home from work. Winston had lived in Manhattan his entire life and was married with three children and had no previous criminal record. Winston was not arrested until six days after Kitty's murder. And he was actually related on a home invasion charge, which was a completely unrelated crime. He was brought in for questioning after the home invasion and being arrested for burglary. And while being questioned, that is when he confessed to the murder of Kitty Genevieve. While going through this interview, Winston Mosley, who again had no criminal record at this point, 
also confessed to the murders and rapes of several other women across New York City. Winston Mosley was given a death sentence on June 15th, 1969, but that was later changed to life in prison in 1967. Over the years, Winston Mosley changed up his story of what exactly happened to Kitty several times. He had his son convinced that he had attacked Kitty because she was yelling racial slurs at him. He also changed his story up telling authorities that a mobster was actually the one to have killed Kitty and he was just simply the getaway driver. But Winston Mosley would pass away in prison on March 28th, 2018, so pretty recent. This case in particular really just gets me so angry and gets me so frustrated because I feel like this case could have so simply have been avoided. I feel like maybe the first t attack couldn't have been stopped. The person yelled out and Winston ran away, but there was several opportunities for any of these like 39 witnesses to have called authorities. I understand not wanting to go down and injecting yourself into what could possibly be a dangerous situation for you, but you could always call somebody. And I wanted to do, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, a different type of video today, but I feel like this video in particular has a certain kind of importance to it because I think that the bystander effect is something that happens more commonly than is spoken about. However, this case is the largest case about that. I just, if you ever witness something, maybe not as horrific as this, but something that is an emergency, no matter how many people are around, if you think somebody else is calling the police, it will never hurt to try and help or make a second call to police ever. You know, it's always better to do too much than to do too little. This case also really got to me because I feel like it is so simple when you're sitting at home watching these types of videos or even for me doing research on these types of videos to try and not internalize everything that is happening. But because this could have been avoided and so many people witnessed this woman's horrific murder, for me it was really, really hard to not internalize this case because that could have been absolutely anybody and it could have so easily been avoided and the end result of this case could have changed dramatically. Many scientists have taken a particular interest in the bystander effect and studies show that statistically people are more likely to intervene or do something where there are not multiple witnesses. This is more likely because people think that somebody else will do something about it. So I just wanted to get this case out there again to just remind you to keep this in the back of your mind. If you ever witness an emergency or something like this, always call the police because again, doing too much is never a bad thing. But guys, that brings us to the end of this video. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below what you'd like to see in my future videos. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you don't miss any future videos from me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys!